Right, so hello and welcome back to Books and Things and welcome to another video and today I'm going to be doing a bit of a Q&A. So as I mentioned a few weeks ago, I'm going to be doing a few different Q&As on my channel over the next couple of weeks. Um, so today I'm going to be doing a sort of like general q and I have um, some bookish questions and some questions about like writing in general, but not about my novel specifically. Um, and then next week I'll do a Q&A, which is all about um, The Secrets of Heart at Hall, my novel, um, but like without any spoilers. Um, and then probably the week after that, I'll do a video, which is a Q&A about The Secrets of Heart at Hall again, but with spoilers. Um, but I did have a few like general writing questions about like writing routines and stuff, which I thought I would just pull in with the general bookish stuff today. I don't think I'm going to film the Hartwood Hall Q&A today, so if you do have any extra questions about the secrets of Hartwood Hall, um, either with or without spoilers, then please leave them down below in the comments, and I'll look out for them before I film the other Q&As. But anyway, let me get on with the questions, um, and I'll try not to ramble too much today, because I do have quite a few to get through. Um, someone asked, what is your most reread book? Um, and my most reread book is probably either Pride and Prejudice or Wuthering Heights. I think it probably is Pride and Prejudice now. I think it used to be Wuthering Heights. I've read both Wuthering Heights and Pride and Prejudice probably at least 10 times. I think probably my most reread book physically is Wuthering Heights because I've only listened to Wuthering Heights once on audiobook or the other times I've, I've read it, I've read it physically. Um, Pride and Prejudice is definitely my most like listened book. I have read it physically quite a lot of times, but I've also listened to the audiobook narrated by Rosamund Pike like at least six or seven times. So yeah, Wuthering Heights and Pride and Prejudice are probably my most reread books. Um, I love them both a lot. Um, I think they're fantastic, wonderful novels, really engaging, really fun, but also they're both very, very rereadable for me. Like I find new things in them every time I reread them. I would also say that like, of my favourite ever novels of all time, they are the shortest, which is one of the reasons why I think they're the most reread. Like, because um, my other kind of favourite books, other books that would make it into my top five, such as Our Mutual Friend by Charles Dickens, or North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell, or Dombey and Son by Charles Dickens, or Wives and Daughters by Elizabeth Gaskell, they're all a lot longer, um, which I think is one of the reasons why I end up returning to Other Hikes and Pride and Prejudice a lot more often, just because I love them very, very dearly and they're not too long. Someone asked me where is the best place to start with Thomas Hardy and where is the best place to start with Charles Dickens. So for Thomas Hardy, I usually say that the best place to start is Far From the Madden Crowd, which is a wonderful book by Thomas Hardy about a young woman called Bathsheba Eversham, um, who is taking over a farm, which is quite an unusual thing for a woman to be doing at this point in time in the Victorian period. Um, and also she has sort of three very different men who are interested in her. I really love Far From the Madden Crowd. I think it's fantastic. I think it's really engaging. It's one of my favourite Thomas Hardy books. And then I would also say that it is one of the Thomas Hardy books that has a more likeable central character, at least I quite like Bathsheba, um, I'm not sure everyone does, but I do, um, and it's also one that is not too miserable. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are bits of Far From the Man and Crowd that are quite grim and sad, but I feel like overall it has a more like uplifting tone to it than some other Hardy books. I don't know if you watch Libby Stevenson, um, but quite a few years ago now, she made a video about the like reading order of Thomas Hardy that she would suggest, which is really fantastic. See if I can find that, I'll leave a link to that down below as well. Don't start with Jude the Obscure because while it is my favorite Thomas Hardy and it is fantastic, it is pretty grim and miserable. I would also say don't start with Tess the Durbervilles because again, it's quite grim and also, I controversially don't think Tess is necessarily his best book um, and I feel like it's a tougher read than some of his other ones and whatever you do, do not start with The Well Beloved because that is the only Thomas Hardy book which is bad. It's just bad. And then in terms of where to start with Charles Dickens, I always recommend that you start with either Great Expectations or David Copperfield. I know that David Copperfield is huge and looks daunting, but the reason why these two books are the best Dickens books to start with is because they're both written in first person. So they are a first person narrative, they're buildings romance, following one character from their childhood into their adulthood. You're always seeing through Pip's eyes in Great Expectations or David's eyes in David Copperfield, which I think um, is really, really great for getting into Dickens because one thing that a lot of people struggle with in Dickens's other books is that he often has like 27 characters and like 15 subplots um, and sometimes it's quite hard to know who is the main character and what you should be focusing on and, and where you are and things like that whereas in 
David Copperfield and Great Expectations, you're following one character and you know who to focus on. And I think that makes it a much easier read. I really recommend both of these. I think they're really fantastic books and, and are the best places to get into Dickens, in my opinion. Another question I had was, if you could only ask one question to your favourite Victorian author, what would it be and why? I mean, I would ask Charles Dickens about the mystery of Edwin Drood and the ending of it. Um, the mystery of Edwin Drood, if you don't know, is the novel that Charles Dickens was writing when he died um, and he was halfway through this mystery novel, The Mystery of Edwin Drood, when he passed away, so he didn't get to finish it. Um, and there are some like notes or like things he said to people where we think we know what he was gonna do with the ending, but it's all a little bit vague. And I read the first half, the only half, of The Mystery of Edwin Drood, um, when I was maybe like 18 or 19 and I loved it. I haven't read it since. I'm really excited to reread it at the end of the Mega Dickens read along, which I'm hosting at the moment. Um, but I remember when I was 18 or 19 reading The Mystery of Evan Drood and thinking, if this was finished, I think I might love this more than our mutual friend. If this was finished, this would be my favourite book of all time, um, maybe. And, and that thought made me sad. So I would really love to have a chat with Dickens about what he's going to do with the ending. I mean, to be honest, if I could just ask him a question, I would probably just ask him to write the second half of The Mystery of Evan Drood. But anyway. Someone asked me which books I have multiple editions of just because I like it too much. Um, so the book I think I have the most editions of, the most physical editions of, is Jane Eyre. So I have four editions of Jane Eyre. I have um, a Collector's Library edition, I also have a Penguin Classics Black Spine edition, and then I also have a um, Penguin Classics Cloth Bound edition, um, and then I also have a Folio Society edition, which is really, really lovely as well. Um, so Jane Eyre is one of my favourite books. Um, I love it very, very much, um, and two of the four um, that I've just held up, I got as presents. Um, so it's a book that people know I love, so I have been given nice editions of it. I think that's probably the only book I've got a lot of editions of. There are quite a few classics that I have two editions of though, because um, as a teenager, I collected these, which are the collector's library. Um, and I really, really love these editions. They're really, really nice little hardbacks of classics. Um, and I really like them a lot. But collector's library was acquired and taken over by Pam McMillan several years ago. And they changed the design into this design. Um, which I do still really like. I think they're really beautiful, but because obviously they don't match in the same way anymore, though they're still the same size, um, I didn't feel quite like the same um, need to carry on collecting the same editions. And also the other thing about the collector's library is that um, they're really nice to listen to classics, but they don't have a massive list. Like they've got a lot of books, but they don't have that many books. You know, I have Jane Eyre and The Channel of Arthur Hall and Wuthering Heights in these editions, but the other four books by the Brontes are not available in these editions. So I decided to start collecting the Penguin Black Spines editions instead because this is the, the classic edition where you can just get the most books, by which I mean you can get every single Dickens novel in this edition, which was what I wanted to do. Um, so I have been collecting these for a while now and I've sort of like moved over. So there are quite a few books. I think probably several Dickens books and several Bronte books, um, at least that I have in both like Collector's Library and the Penguin Black Spine. But in general, I don't like collect multiple editions of the same book on purpose. Talking of book editions, another question I had was, um, I'd love to get your thoughts on hardcover editions for a home library, preferably ones with illustrations um, and ones that include a wide selection of books. I know the Collector's Library as well as Eastern Press. I don't know Eastern Press actually, so I have to look them up. So as I've just been saying, I used to collect Collector's Library and I now collect Penguin Classics Black Spine. So I don't really have much knowledge of that many other editions. Um, there are lots of nice hardback editions of classics. Um, I think the Penguin Cloth Band ones are really nice, but I don't think they have that big a selection. Certainly they don't have nearly as big a selection in comparison to the Penguin Black Spine ones. I really like the Collector's Library. I think they're really nice, both the old ones and the new ones. And some of them do have illustrations in um, some of the Dickens ones, definitely have illustrations in um, and they're really lovely little hardbacks and I also like that they are small hardbacks because um, often I think hardbacks are too big but beyond that I can't really think of many other like nice static editions that I know of um, in hardback but yeah I'll have to have a think and I'll have to look up Eastern Press. Someone asked me what the longest book I have ever read is um, and that would either be War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy or Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. I think War and Peace is probably slightly longer, but I'm not 100% certain about that. But those two would definitely be the two longest books I've ever read, and I love them both very much, and Les Miserables more, I would say. But it has admittedly been about half my life since I last read Les Miserables. Someone asked me, what is one genre that you never like, or do you like to read all genres? So I would probably say that I do like to read all genres. Like, there are definitely some genres I read 
more than others. I read a lot of historical fiction, I read a lot of classics, not that that's a genre, but you know, a book category, whatever you want to call it. I enjoy sci-fi fantasy, I enjoy rom-coms. Um, I would have always previously said that the genre that I never read and didn't like was horror, but lately I have been listening to the Magnus Archives, which is this fantastic podcast, um, which is basically sort of interlinked short stories um, in the form of a podcast and it's horror and it's fantastic and I love it um, and this has made me think maybe I could read some horror novels and would enjoy them I don't know um, maybe there's something about the shorter sort of short story podcast format that works better for me I don't know um, but yeah I think there's probably not any genres that I wouldn't read there's just genres that I would have like more preference to oh and I would also say that like anything really 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 literary and really experimental is less likely to be my cup of tea. Like I would still try books that are really, really literary, but in general I tend to prefer like slightly more commercial or like reading group, um, sort of the place between commercial and literary fiction rather than like the really, really literary stuff. Like if a book has been long listed for the book prize, I think my chances of loving it are a little bit smaller. Someone asked me what my favorite children's book is. Um, and I'm not really sure actually, when I was a child, like an actual child, um, not a teenager, my favorite book was Ink Heart by Cornelia Funke, which I really, really loved as a child. And my favorite children's book that I've read as an adult would probably be His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman. And um, the whole trilogy I think is really, really great. And I say I read them as an adult. I did read them when I was a child, but as a child I liked them, but I didn't love them, and then I listened to them on audiobook and reread them as an adult and, and got a lot more out of them. So probably his dark materials if I had to pick like a favourite children's book. Now the question I had was what some of my favourite Brazilian books were. Um, and my favourite Brazilian book is definitely um the posthumous memoirs of Brass Cubas by Machado de Assis, which I thought was fantastic and like so interestingly and complicatedly written. Um, but two other books that I have read which I really enjoyed, two other Brazilian classics would be um, um, the House of the Star by Clarice Lispector um, and also The Sad End of Polycarpo Charisma by Lima Barreto. All three of these books I thought were really really good. I will say as well that I um, have read quite a few Brazilian classics now and I've been really enjoying reading Brazilian classics but I haven't actually read very much Brazilian contemporary literature at all so if anyone has any recommendations for me for contemporary Brazilian books then please leave them down below in the comments. Another question I had was um, I'm visiting London soon what are some good Charles Dickens sites? Um, so the best place to go as a Dickens fan in London is the Charles Dickens Museum on Doughty Street which um, is a fantastic museum it's one of the houses where Dickens used to live um, and it's really really lovely really interesting got lots of interesting stuff in um, and lots of details about his writing and his life um, so I really really recommend going to the Charles Dickens Museum they also do quite good events as well so it's worth kind of looking up seeing if they have anything special on then depending on how long you're in London for or whether you can like go on day trips out of London um, there are a few like interesting Dickens sites not too far from London, like day trippable from London. Later in his life, Dickens lived in Rochester, um, which is not that far out of London. Um, and you can go and visit Gads Hill Place, which is the house where Charles Dickens lived. Um, you have to like book on a tour. You can't just go and turn up. It's not a museum. It is a school a lot of the time. So I think there are probably limitations on what days you can go around and visit too. Um, basically, I went round it um, many years ago now when the when the Charles Dickens Museum in London was shut for refurbishment they opened Gans Hill Place like over the summer when the school wasn't there um, for you to go and have a look round it like a museum which was fantastic um, and I thought it was amazing this is quite a long time ago now um, but I have seen on their website that they are doing tours again um, so I will leave links to that down below because that's well worth looking at as well um, and then also if you can get out of Broadstairs which is a seaside town again not too far from London definitely day trippable and in Broadstairs, there is the Dickens House Museum, which is a house um, where a woman used to live. And this woman was the model for Betsy Trotwood from David Copperfield. <laughs> but the museum has a lot of information about Charles Dickens and his life. And it's really nice. Um, and Broadstairs is also lovely. Um, I'm not sure if the person who asked this question is from the UK or not. But if you're not from the UK, Broadstairs is like... Um, the quintessential British seaside for me so um, well worth going there too. Moving away from books for a minute someone asked me what are your non-bookish hobbies? So I don't really have any non-bookish hobbies I mean my main hobbies are reading, writing and making booktube videos which to be honest takes up like a lot of 
the time. Um, so I don't really have many other hobbies. My other like main hobby when I was a teenager used to be music. Um, I played three instruments when I was a teenager. It's been like a decade since I last played the trumpet or the euphonium, but I used to have a keyboard and I can play it and, and do sometimes, but not that often, to be honest. There are other things I enjoy doing. I watch some TV, I watch some films. I quite like doing a puzzle. I have one computer game that I play called Don't Starve, which I really enjoy because it's quite fun, slightly weird, and um, you can play it while listening to an audiobook because it doesn't require much brain power. To be honest, my life is just pretty narrowly focused on books. Someone else asked me, what are your three favourite songs of all time? Having just said that I have no hobbies apart from books, um, I do really enjoy listening to music. I don't actually listen to music as much as I used to. I used to listen to music a lot as a teenager um, and I don't as much anymore. Partly because I listen to a lot of audiobooks, I suppose, or booktube in the time when I might have once listened to music. I do listen to quite a lot of music while I'm driving though, um, which is nice. Um, and I do often like go through a phase where I really like a song and I just like look it up on YouTube and play it randomly. Um, but yes, my three favourite songs of all time um, would probably be This Is All That Matters by Duke Special, um, Piazza New York Catcher by Bell and Sebastian, and This Ain't New Jersey by Smith and Burroughs. However, This Ain't New Jersey is a Christmas song, which I only am allowed to listen to for like six six weeks of the year so I feel like I should be allowed to pick another one um, in which case I might pick I Have Been Around the World by Dar Williams um, those are four very excellent songs but I also did want to mention my like current favourite song by which I mean the current song which I don't know if it'll be a forever favourite but I currently like look up on YouTube and play randomly um, and that is a song called Charles Dickens by a band called Huck Finn um, and I just really enjoy that it's a song called Charles Dickens. I found it because I was making a, a TikTok, a booktok video and I was looking for a Dickens song to book for a Dickens video and I found a song called Charles Dickens and it's actually really good so now I just listen to that all the time so yeah. Someone asked me, in fact Americon from booktube, I'll link her channel down below, um, she asked me do you have any tips on managing your time as a freelancer especially if your hobby and work is closely related? Yeah as I have just mentioned, my main hobbies are books um, and also my work is books. And also like writing now occupies a weird place in my life where it is partly my job, but also it is still my hobby as well, but in a different way, I guess, to how it used to be. In terms of managing your time as a freelancer, when I went freelance, I thought I would stick really closely to the same schedule every day. And I drew myself out a schedule for like when I would start um, work and when I would take lunch breaks and, and all of that kind of stuff. And that is actually not turned out to be how I do freelancing at all um, and I actually found like trying to stick to a really rigid schedule every day didn't work and um, so what I do instead is I have a to-do list every day um, for how many hours I want to spend on like each thing that I need to do um, and where I want to get up to in a particular job or a particular project um, and that works much better for me than having like a rigid schedule which means I don't necessarily stick to regular working hours in the same way but I do find that works much better for me because it's more flexible and I also try and like add leisure time onto my to-do list so sometimes I will put like read on my to-do list for a day like to tell myself that as well as doing seven hours work on an edit and two hours at work writing I should also spend an hour reading. To be honest I feel like the main issue I have as a freelancer is that I am inclined to work all the time and not stop um which again if you're hobby and your um, work are closely related is a bit tricky to do. One thing I have is I have um, this planner, this is a Clever Fox planner um, and it has like a daily to-do list and it also has like a, a habits thing so you can write down like things you want to do every day and then you can tick them off um, which I found really helpful. I got sent one of these for a review ages ago but there are lots of like similar to-do lists you can find online which you know are large um, to-do list templates with like daily to-do lists and things like that and the other thing I do which is really really helpful and um, which I would really recommend doing is that I keep a track of all of my hours that I work um, which I have to do anyway because I'm a freelance editor um, and a lot of the jobs I do I'm charging by the hour anyway so I need to keep a really like tight um, control on what hours I'm working um, and I use the time app on my phone to like set my timer for three hours okay I'm doing three hours work then I have a break and then I'll set my timer again for three hours then I know I've done six hours or whatever so I track the hours that I spend doing freelance editing that I'm getting paid for and then I track the hours I spend doing freelance work admin that I'm not getting paid for but I do need to do like applying to emails and that kind of thing and then I also track the hours that I spend writing the hours I spend doing writing related admin um, and the hours I spend doing like research or historical research for writing um, and then I also track the amount of time I spend on booktube and um, so I have like this massive spreadsheet where I track like the hours I spend doing those three things in a week. I think it's a really really good idea to track your time and in the same spreadsheet where I have like a list of things I need to do um, and 
I track my time. I also have like a track of like how many days holiday have I had and that kind of thing. In general, like being a freelancer, I feel like managing your time is one of the difficult things. But yeah, keeping a like close track of how many hours I work a day and how many hours I work a week. That's probably the thing I find the most like useful in terms of managing my time as a freelancer. On a kind of similar note, I had quite a lot of people ask me about like making time for writing in amongst lots of other busy stuff happening um, and sort of what my writing routine is like and how that's kind of changed since before Heart It All came out um, to now. So in general, my writing routine has sort of been the same for a very long time. Um, when I was 14 years old, I decided that I was going to be a serious writer. And so I decided that I was going to get up early every day to write before school. For more than half my life now, I have been getting up early in the morning before anything else I have to do um, in order to write for at least an hour before whatever else I have to do. Um, so Monday to Friday, when I was at school, when I was at university, when I was working full time in house, um, I would get up an hour earlier than I needed to in order to write before school or work or whatever. However, as I've just mentioned, I went freelance last year, so that does slightly change things. Um, but I still do get up at 6.30 a.m every day Monday to Friday in order to write in the morning but now I try to write for two hours in the morning rather than one so when I was writing The Secrets of Heart Hall I was really writing for, for one hour a day Monday to Friday and not having that much other time to write but now I'm freelance I don't have to commute my time is much more flexible I can start other work whenever I want to and um, so I always try and write for two hours every morning Monday to Friday and then once I've done my two hours writing I will carry on with whatever else work I have on for the day which most of the time is freelance editorial work but sometimes is carrying on writing for the rest of the day um, if I have a day or two between different freelance projects then I will spend a full day writing or if I have a writing deadline coming up or something like that then I will sometimes clear out some space to just focus on writing so in some ways my writing routine is quite similar to what it was a year ago but in some ways it's quite different I suppose Big Hard Books and Classics who also has a bit of channel I'll link down below asked me um, do you write in longhand first or just straight on a typer yeah I always write on the computer I never write longhand I almost never write by hand now I write to do lists by hand and that's basically all I write by hand. I really like writing on a computer much more. I can type much faster and it's so much easier to edit. And my handwriting is terrible, um, which isn't a problem when I'm typing on a computer. So yes, I always write on a computer and I find that much more natural for me. I think for as long as I've been writing, like creative writing, I have been using a computer. In fact, probably the reason why I started getting up early in the morning to write before school was probably actually because that was the time no one else wanted the family computer. So yeah, I've always written on a computer. Lisa in Bookland, whose channel I'll link down below, asked me, do you keep copies of old drafts and all your editing red lines to look back on or do you delete them? I keep everything. Um, there are so many drafts of The Secrets of Hartwood Hall on my computer. There are so many drafts of the book I'm writing currently on my computer. There are so many drafts of so many different books um, on my computer so many different books and so many different short stories. I keep everything. Basically every time I get to the end and finish a draft, I will copy the file and rename the new file. Um, I used to rename them draft one, draft two, draft three, draft four, but there did come a point with the secrets of Hall where I was like, if I give this to my editor and it says draft 15 on it, are they gonna laugh at me? So now I name my drafts like, book title June 2023 or whatever. A couple of people asked me how my job affects my writing, um, whether I like am more hard on myself as a writer because I'm an editor and whether my sort of career in publishing has helped or hindered my writing. I think it's definitely helped my writing a lot, um, both in terms of sort of like familiarity with the market and thinking about writing commercially and that kind of thing. Um, but also a lot of the same skills are involved in being an editor as are involved in being a writer. Not all the same skills, but there's a lot of crossover. So working as an editor definitely makes me a better writer. Um, especially sort of working on structural edits um, where I'm like picking apart plots and working out what does and doesn't work in another writer's plot um, because the thing I find hardest myself is plotting um, as a writer. Actually, I think I'm quite a good editor at plot, um, but I find it much harder in my own work. So I feel like being an editor definitely makes me a better writer. I don't know whether it means that I'm harder on myself, probably not. Um, like I think I am relatively good at editing my own work as well as editing other people's, but you definitely have like things you can't see in your own work. You definitely have problems you can't see in your own work because you know the characters and you know the backstory and you know the world and it's all in your head. It's very hard to tell sometimes if you're getting all of that onto the page. I am pretty harder on myself for some of the technical stuff though. Definitely I feel like because I work as a freelance copy editor. Um, I wasn't working as a freelance copy editor when The Secrets of Heart Hall went to copy edit, but on the book I'm working on now, I do feel a bit like if this goes to copy edit, 
and there's any mistakes in it. I'm gonna be very ashamed because as a copy editor, I feel like I should have weeded them all out before it went to anyone else. Um, but obviously, as I said, there are things you can't spot in your own work. And then the final question for today, um, somebody asked me, if I were to set my plot in the Victorian era, what are a few things I should keep in mind while writing? There are a lot of things you should keep in mind while writing if you're setting a plot in the Victorian era. Um, a lot of the like general social, cultural, economic, political, technological differences. Um, but I feel like if you're writing something set in the Victorian period, you probably do know that anyway. I feel like the thing that is really, really worth bearing in mind that I feel like people are slightly less likely to think about is that the Victorian period is really long. And if you set your book in 1840, that is very different to setting your book in 1860, which is very different to setting your book in 1880, which is very different to setting your book in like 1900. Like the Victorian period lasted a really long time and changed a lot. So I would say if you're setting your book in the Victorian period, pick a year. Even if you don't say the year in your novel, pick a year. Um, because if you pick that year, you can check was this thing invented at this time? What were people wearing in this year? Um, what was the fashion like? And what were houses like? And what words were in use? And all of that kind of thing. I think it's really helpful to pick a year so that you know exactly when you're setting it within the Victorian period, because the Victorian period is so long um, and changed a lot. And actually the small details of a particular time um, would really affect your plot um, and your story, I suppose. So that's probably the main advice I would give, because I think that's the kind of thing that people don't necessarily think about as much. If you're writing a book set in the Victorian period, obviously you think very much about the fact that the Victorian period is different to today, but you don't necessarily think as much about the fact that a particular year in the Victorian period was actually very different to like, 10 years either side. Um, so that's probably one of the main things I would say that it's worth thinking about. And then I think that's all for today. I hope this video hasn't been too rambly. Um, as I said, I will have a couple of other Q and A's up in the next couple of weeks, um, a bit more focused on my novel, The Secrets File at All, though I know I've kind of mentioned it once or twice today. Um, but yeah, I think that's all for now. Let me know down in the comments if you have any other questions, I'll try and answer them below. That's all for now. Thanks so much for watching and I'm back very soon with another bookish video.